Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Placing Faces, the show where we sit down with some of the most influential casting directors in all of Hollywood and across the entertainment spectrum. I'm your host, Charlie Chappell, and today we get to sit down with casting director, former president of the Casting Society of America, two times, and Emmy winner for Outstanding Achievement in Casting, Richard Hicks. Richard has been in casting since the early 90s and has gone on to cast a really broad range of movies, from Gravity, Zero Dark Thirty, and Curb Your Enthusiasm, to Charlie Bartlett, Lars and the Real Girl, Dude Where's My Car, 2008's City of Ember, a new favorite of mine starring a really, really young Saoirse Ronan, Real Steel, and my favorite movie of 2016, Hell or High Water. Richard was unsurprisingly easy to talk to. You look at his picture on IMDb and it says to me, hey, you and me, let's chat. But for the fact that he's worked on a few of my favorite films of the past couple decades, I didn't really know what to expect. I'm coming to find there isn't really a whole lot of information on casting directors' backgrounds, so little did I know that Richard is a Midwestern fellow like myself. Hailing from Ohio, Richard's enthusiasm, good nature, and love for the entertainment industry was very apparent when we first met 15 minutes before we began recording. He seems to be an incredibly generous casting director with an abundant empathy for actors, probably because Richard was an actor himself. Somehow, this Midwesterner in the 1980s found himself attending the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. His class included the likes of Ralph Fiennes, David Morrissey, and the extremely amazing Alex Kingston. After he left there, he ended up working in New York theater, and well, I'll just let him tell the rest of the story about how he became a casting director. It's a good one. This is a particularly great episode if you're interested in the ins and outs of the casting process. Richard's involvement with the CSA and his reflective nature comes with a lot of insight. We'll find out what the CSA is tasked with, how you can become involved with casting, and one of the ways that you could get the elusive Bill Murray in your movie. We'll also delve into actors and their superpowers. So without any further ado, I hope you learn as much as I did. Welcome. Thank you. Happy thanks, to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, I like to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. How did you get into casting? Where do you come from and, and how did you get into this world? Uh, let's see, I'm uh, from the Midwest, grew up in Ohio, and after college I went to RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art uh, in London, and that was a really formative time for me because I was with some of the best actors in England, you know, who were 20. You know, like in my class was like Rape Fiennes and, and Jane Horrocks and Ian Glenn, who's on Game of Thrones, yeah. and Jason Watkins and David Morrissey, who's a quality uh, actor from Liverpool. Like these awesome, awesome people. And I remember, like I was a sometimes amazing, but sometimes not good actor. Because I was in my head. And, and that became clear when I was at drama school because like, I remember doing a play with with Jane, and she did this scene, and I was on stage with her, and it took me out of it. And afterwards, I said, "Well, how did you do that?" And she was like, <laughs> "I don't know. I just thought of my mom." And I was like, "You mean you didn't have to do research or da 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 da?" You know, when like, you're in the scene, going, "Wow, you're really good." Yes, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. So uh, anyway, after drama school, I came back to the states and was a theater actor, mm -hmm. uh, mostly regional theater, like the Guthrie, and then I was living in New York and doing well, real plays. Real quick, and before musicals. we go into that, uh -huh. how does a kid from the Midwest and Ohio end up at RADA? Um, because that's a huge, like, that's where they teach actors. How to act good. How to act real good. <laughs> well, you, you know, there are a bunch of awesome drama schools that you could sure. go to in the States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that, I think after college, I went for acting, but I knew I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'd heard about it. You know, with any of those drama schools, you apply, you send in an application, and usually there's an audition process. Sure. And you audition, and they take you where they don't. It was one of the uh, one of the best auditions I ever gave was luckily at the Rod Audition, because I auditioned sure. for... Juilliard, and I auditioned for Lambda and a couple others, and didn't get in, didn't get any interest in any of those. Mm -hmm. But I got a scholarship, and so, you know, I'm from Ohio. This is yeah. a beautiful thing to end up, you know, right where there. Theater yeah, where, yeah, where theater started. Yeah, yeah, where theater started, and and you know, where the, in a town where people really 
give a shit about theater. Yeah, that's right. Which that's is, right. It's part of the cultural yeah. conversation, mm -hmm. um, um, which is true in New York, but n hardly true most other places. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so after RADA, I uh, worked as an actor and auditioned. And one thing that I didn't do well with was not working. When in the downtime, or like I would spend enormous amount of energy worrying about the moment to come, the audition to come, mm -hmm. and then enormous amount of energy worrying about it after it happened. And, you know, wishing and praying and doing the I Ching and hoping, rereading sure. the secret and <laughs> da 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 da. Uh -huh. And none of that is germane. Um, what I tell actors is the only time that you are guaranteed the power in the conversation, the, pretty much the only time when you're starting, is that moment of the audition. In that moment, we hand over the power to you, and we watch you, and then after you do your thing, we take it back and we assess it and judge it and compare it and all the things you do. Um, so it's incumbent upon the actor to do their very best to own what they do in that moment. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I was in casting, because I, I couldn't handle that well. And so, how often do you see actors coming and not handling that well? Like t literally taking taking the room, as you said, you're handing that over to them. How often do you hand it over and they don't take I it? I think I think once you get to I think uh, once you get to a certain level, most people are doing okay at it okay. or good at it. When you're when you're working at the highest level, everybody's doing it. Sure, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we get in a in a in a in a luxury that is. Uh, one, you know, a beautiful thing to be on this side of, we get to compare the different shades of awesome ah. that come through the door and figure out like, well, how does that, how does that compare to the role we've got and how does this choice affect what we would need to do in the storytelling or what we would need to do in the, um, in the casting of the other parts. Sure. Uh, it's like a puzzle that you are kind of creating the other pieces for once you put in the first puzzle piece. And that first puzzle piece, what is that first puzzle piece? Depends on the, depends on the circumstances, but it's usually the, one of the lead characters. Okay. And then from there, you're starting to build these other pieces based off of whatever colors that they bring in uh -huh. to, that fit around that and complement that piece. In an ideal world, yes. In an yes, ideal yes, world. yes, in sure. an ideal world. Okay. Uh, sometimes you are casting, sometimes, sometimes you, you try to cast a part that I know I'm going to get or that I, or that is like, or that, there, or sometimes I start with the part that's the hardest to do because if you've only got a few one of these, mm -hmm. you, it's going to be one of these. You try and set that, you know, so that the ones that have variables that you could live with in them, you can, you can, you can then fit that to this. Yeah. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. nailing down the one thing that has to be that one thing, and then yeah, that's one way that. of doing it. Sometimes I cast um, when you're moving quickly. Sometimes I am simultaneously seeing people for the hard to cast parts, and then knocking out the easy to cast parts. Okay. You know, like like I'll like I'll start auditioning for the lead, but I'll at the same time be having auditions for the two line parts because those I have a kind of database of people that I would know or the specs are specific, so I can go look for them and try and try and um, get that out of the way so that there's more time if I'm going to need it for the hard to cast part. Okay, so. I guess going off of the back end of You Were Out, what was that transition like into casting? Because you, you started off with Ronnie Yeskul, mm -hmm. yeah? What was it like starting with Ronnie? It, it, because that you were a casting associate. Assistant, start, I started assistant, as an assistant, right? Yeah, yeah. And now you work with Ronnie fairly often. We do occasionally. I, we, we, uh, we, I was her assistant, then her associate, then her partner, okay. and then I went out on my own, and then our paths have occasionally crossed sure. since, but now we're just kind of our ships. Sure, yeah. passing in the night. Yeah. yeah. How did that relationship go? Because one of the, we were, like we were talking earlier, one of the audience that we're trying to go after, uh -huh. are people who want to get into casting. How did that go from being an actor and auditioning, doing plays, 
to becoming an assistant with the casting? Uh, let's see. One of the things which stood me in good stead when I went into casting was, as an actor, I enjoyed seeing everything. I went to see mm. plays. I ushered at theaters in New York so that I could get a seat and sure. watch the play. And so I saw a ton of off-Broadway stuff that way. Right. Um, I, uh, I, you know, just tried to go see everything I could as a way to kind of deal with all this extra time and energy I had, but also because I was genuinely interested. And a lot of what casting is, is knowing a lot of things about a lot of actors and having an opinion about them. So I had a leg up because I w had seen a bunch of things and knew what I thought about a bunch of things. When I, st when I stopped acting, one thing that is what surprised me was um, I just, I didn't, I was 30 and I didn't know what to do, but I knew that this wasn't it anymore, even though it was the only thing that I loved in the whole world. And I just stopped and it broke my heart at the time. And I was like, I don't know what to do, but I know I have to give this up. And but, but why? What was because, uh, be, I don't know. Just because I just, you couldn't deal with the... I couldn't handle the, I couldn't handle the, the idea that I, the work I was doing was less and less good copies of good. So there okay. I was doing kind of a similar play in a smaller venue in a bad copy of what I'd done before. And I think one thing that uh, quality actors can do is they find what's true about what they're doing and give it relevance in in their in their uh, current life. Okay. You know yeah. what I mean? Like at their will, they can look at a script and find out why it means something to them and express that. What I did what I did before was like, oh yeah, that really worked before, so I'm going to go back and have that feeling uh, again, which is a which is only a copy of the real sure. feeling. Sure. It's manufacturing. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so like it didn't it wasn't so I didn't get the job cuz I was sure. giving an odd, a manufactured performance instead of an authentic one. Do you have any recommendations on finding people to work with? Finding somebody uh, Let's see, to yes. Yeah. If you are interested in casting, the Casting Society of America has a website to, where you can go online and you can sign up to receive emails so that when a CSA member is looking for a casting assistant. Oh, okay. You can't. You receive a blast, mm -hmm. and then you can send in your resume, and you know, conceivably, get a gig. Sure. What sort of things would casting directors be looking for on that resume, or from, uh, from previous assistant? experience in casting? Maybe okay. interning. Often it's agency experience. Okay. Often it's like um, how would I say it? Like I all I I try to. Do I try to hire people who've done worked in casting before? But everybody has to start somewhere, and it's often people who you know um, you can kind of like somebody's been a dramaturg at a theater company. Uh, somebody was somebody got a job that way with us. Often in your cover letter, you can say I I I have no experience casting, but I have this experience, which I believe to be relevant and uh, and a well written, passionate. Like one time, we hired a kid from Australia because he talked about he'd seen everything that we'd done and he'd seen uh, every he 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 had a um, encyclopedic knowledge of of the movies that year and na 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 and we're like okay because like a lot of it is the is the willing, you know, is the passion for it. Absolutely. You know, there's there's logistical things you need to be able to do. You need to type, you need to, uh, or you know, it helps. You need to type and you need to be able to be chill under a, a you know, busy situation. Um, you need to be speedy. You need to, you would need to have, it helps to have a, a video experience because mm -hmm. a lot now all, most of film and TV auditions are on video, so, uh, editing it, uploading it, downloading it, pulling it from sites, all of that kind of stuff is our helpful skills for a modern casting assistant. Okay, great. So you've talked a little bit about the CSA. You were mm -hmm. uh, the president of CSA. I don't really know, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people probably don't either. What is the CSA and what is the purpose of the CSA? The CSA, the Casting Society of America, mm -hmm. is the professional association started in the early 80s, I think, um, to kind of stand up for casting and f as a way for 
the, its members to provide support for each other and help each other. Back in the day, you know, as, as that beautiful uh, documentary Casting By showed, yeah. casting directors were kind of like little lone uh, lights out there, you know, um, uh, with their individual ways of working and no real support as a community. And CSA's uh, mission is to help support the work of the casting director and to advocate for casting's impact in the creative process. Okay. So with that, how did you become affiliated and how did you eventually become president of CSA Choice? Um, let's see. Uh, to become affiliated with CSA, you have to be working in casting either as an associate or as a casting director for a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's two years of credits or something like that. Okay. And then you're working, you're working, you're working, and then after a while, you apply to uh, join, and if you have the uh, requisite amount of credits, uh, then you, then you're admitted. So is it, it's not like the union. No, it's them. a separate thing. Right, it's completely separate. Uh, 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 yes, it's a separate thing. The union sure. is there to deal with only film and television and only the kind of working conditions and health and pension benefits that uh, accrue sure. with working in film and television. Um, for the longest time we didn't have that and I was part of the committee which which founded the union in film and television. Oh, that's great. It was, so is it, it a was. separate union, or is it one of the unions that's kind of tied together are, with a couple? Uh, we, yeah, we are part of the Teamsters. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, 399 in LA and 118, I think, in New York. The Teamsters were the only union willing to take us on at the time, and, we, and so we're with them. Huh. Why? Why was that the case? Why? I think it was because uh, the Hollywood, as a corporation, was uh, didn't want us to unionize because that may cost them money. Sure, and it's all, of course. At the end of the day, it's all about money. It is, yeah. or that part of it is all about money. Yeah. And they didn't. Uh, and we, I think, learned as a community too, um, kind okay. of as a defense against being snubbed. Create, you know, as a creative craft. Uh, we thought we were fancy and, you know, okay. and it was a mystical process and da 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 da, da. Um, Which we almost, we, there was a moment where we could have, where we might have uh, gone with um, IATSE, but, mm -hmm. but that match didn't happen, partly out of, uh, out of our own kind of um, not wanting to join, okay. I guess. Sure. Um, but that, but, and more fool us because at the end of the day, we're all doing we're all doing. We're doing a combination between art and craft. Absolutely. And and uh, and it's a beautiful thing to have over uh, have uh, how many years? Uh, uh, Twelve years maybe of health and pension benefits for the work that we've been doing. Okay. Um, you know, would that it had started earlier, but it had to start somewhere. And the casting directors and associates now will have a retirement. From the get-go. That's yeah, great. Yeah, from the get-go. That's, That's great. fantastic. Yeah, it's good. Um, so now I kind of want to go into some of the movies that you've done. Okay. Uh, I, I have to start with Hell or High Water. Mm -hmm. um, that was my favorite movie of 2016. Thank it you. Was I it. I it was amazing. I love working on it. It was such a great movie, and, yeah. and David McKenzie is... He's the real deal, that guy. Phenomenal. Yeah. I, I actually got a chance to watch that movie uh, at the the Cinerama Dome mm -hmm. with McKenzie and Chris Pine was there and oh, Jeff cool. Bridges, oh, like the cool. whole cast. Nice. Uh, uh, ben Foster uh -huh. is a god in my book. That, uh -huh. guy, that guy can yeah, act his really ass good. off. Yeah. Uh, and Gil Birmingham yep. who was, who was there too. Yeah, and, yeah. and he was quietly spoken, but oh, he was really, really good in that movie. Yeah, we love it. I, I have to ask the softball question first. Okay. How did you end up with that cast, and how did this project come to you? Uh, it came to me uh, in a pinch, like they had just lost Brad Pitt, and they had, and Chris Pine had said, "Yes, I'll play that part." So Brad Pitt was originally uh -huh. supposed to play, and oh, they wow. lost Brad Pitt, but gained Chris Pine. But Chris Pine had to do it before Star, Star Trek, Trek yeah, one yeah. Of Star Trek movies, and so it was like, "Go." Because it was a quick turnaround. Yes, they it were, was. Because they did a Q and A afterwards, and uh -huh. that was like, yeah, they were. They shot that in like moments, twenty days yes, or something, uh -huh. which yes, is it was. insane. Yeah, it was. But you know, like David really knows his stuff. He and does. So it was like go, and by the way, we need a guy who's half 
Indian, half Mexican, and sure. you know, could be Comanche Navy. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Sure. And uh, that can hang on with Jack. That can Bridges. hold it exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and so I went into the meeting with with David with with some pictures of uh, of Native American actors, and Gil was one of them, and and. Um, we got to, I got to audition most, any, you know, it was a beautiful part, so everybody was up for auditioning. Yeah. And um, and because it was a beautiful script, like, um, it was so much fun to kind of work with the actor to, because what I often do is I often um, see the actor first mm -hmm. and direct them before they see the director. Okay. So that so that uh, so that that version will be the best version that it can be. Then the best of those go to the director, who then decides if he he or she wants to see anybody in person or hire them off of the tape or whatever. It used to be much more like many people came to see the director. Now, because of technology, mm -hmm. it's both good and bad. But the good part of it is I can, in a relaxed way, work creatively you know, exhaustively with the actor to sure. get it to be on point. And that way it's the best version of what it could be. So, and that happens well, after... Best version it could be without the director's input. So does that happen, that's, that's after the first stage of going through everybody, narrowing it down to a smaller group that you then work with? Depends on, depends on the, on the, on the scope of the work. Okay. Like with with for Gill's part, mm -hmm. since the uh, Nat uh, uh, First Nations Native American community is relatively small, sure. like I would read with as many people as I can get in the room, okay. and then the self tapes would come in from around the country. Often with a part that's you know, like Hairspray, where we saw thousands, sure. like we would have each person do a tiny little snippet and make a cut based on that. Okay, so now I, a little bit deeper of a question with that. With this one in particular, I know you said, uh, so it came originally with Brad Pitt, but he dropped yep. and you picked up Chris Pine. When you're casting for chemistry, how do you do that? I don't know how else to uh, lay out that question because the chemistry in that movie, both between Gil and between Jeff Bridges mm -hmm. and between, like there, well, there was a mirror you, image uh -huh. of the camaraderie and the, the relationships yes. there yes. with both of them. How do you find that? How, how? Well, you know, like like there was there's, there was another uh, uh, Native American actor in in the running who was full of uh, fire, if you will. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, like uh, his thing. Um, uh, Jay Roach, a director I've worked with, he calls them their superpower. Like their superpower is their smarts. Their superpower oh, is their sexuality. Okay. You know, like what can they There's do? There's a defining nobody... characteristic. Yes, sure. that's what he calls it. But like with Gil, the kind of quiet, wry, observance, droll uh -huh. thing. With a little bit of a backhanded remark every yes, now and again. Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. he was able, he was, he did in a way that that helped him win the part. Okay. So like you could so like when you're casting for chemistry, sometimes you can do a chemistry read. Mm -hmm. Often uh, with with movies, they match people up and do a mix and match session of a couple of contenders. Um, I forget. Uh, maybe maybe Gil met. Jeff, but I don't think so. Okay. I don't remember for sure. So that chemistry was between them then, if they didn't meet, that was manufactured, and, or well, and manufactured might be the wrong word, but no, you created have to, you have on to, set and it was built created, between yes, the two of them. Right, but as, as the that. casting director, you can um, observe Gil's uh, quietness, mm -hmm. and you can read the script and see the kind of interplay, the kind of uh, guy way of Insulting each other means sure. I like you, and you can you can feel that in the script, and that's a, that's a leap that you become willing to make. Okay. Over another choice, which this sure. guy who was awesome but full of fire, like that fire would have no place to go in that conversation. No, and how that'll play off of Jeff Bridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like yeah. you don't you never know for sure, but over the course of your career, mm -hmm. you build up a data a, a, a database of how of of how you feel about things. Sure. So like you are willing, it's, that becomes a, a, a match that you are able to advocate for and figure out words how to advocate for. Okay, yeah, right. That makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Well, I wanna go into 
Next, another movie that maybe not a lot of people have seen. Uh, I hadn't seen it until I started researching you. Okay. Um, Temple Grandin. Uh huh. Holy shit. Yep. Um, pardon uh, my French, they, everyone, but. You're allowed to speak French. Wow. It was good, huh? She was. Wasn't she awesome? How did you find Claire Danes for this role? Because I. Well, she was offered the part. We didn't okay. have auditions. I did that one with uh, David Rubin, my uh, yeah. then casting partner. Uh, Here is one of the things we talked about in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Claire is an extraordinary actress who doesn't quite fit in the Hollywood paradigm. When the part calls for an extraordinarily intelligent performance, mm -hmm. I think that's when she's at her best. Okay. And Temple Grandin, to balance the autism of the character with the gifts of the scientist of the character, if you will, sure. um, uh, uh, her innate intelligence, I think, kind of is something that she's able to access that uh, that makes it extraordinary. Sure, so that's her superpower. Kind her of, superpower, yeah. yeah. To quote Jay Roach. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't get over that movie. I, I watched it and it sat with me. Oh, nice. Um, because I, I grew up on a cattle farm, so oh, yeah. I, I, I had heard about Temple a long time ago. Did you ever Did you ever put yourself in one of those? Uh, I never did. We things? had We had one on. What are they called? Uh, she called it her squeeze machine. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if we ever had. A you term didn't know for which one. It. It, uh -huh, uh -huh. it, it was the thing right. locks the cow yep. into place, so you can inoculate them or, or whatever you've got uh -huh. to do. How is it that you go about? And this is for for this movie and for Stand uh, Please Stand By. Mm -hmm. How is it that you go about casting somebody who's autistic or casting a character who's autistic? I think you rely on their skill as an actor. Okay. Often. Because you said that one was offered to mm -hmm. Claire. Mm -hmm. How, if you're offering that to somebody, you have to already believe. pretty much believe that they're capable of coming in mm -hmm. and knocking that out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure with the other one, with Please Stand By, was that uh, put to Dakota Fanning? She was attached before I got she was. it, I think. Okay. okay. But similarly, somebody offered it to her. Okay, yeah. sure, because, because she's another one who couldn't. Knock it out of the Yeah, bar. no, she's really yeah. great. Uh, uh, what's your question about it, though? Um, the question is, I, I guess it's a two-parter. The, the idea of casting somebody with autism can can probably be a little bit frightening for somebody who's either new into casting or just because it's it is one of those subjects. Well, that's interesting. Matters. I mean, like I would say, I would say, uh, one way to describe autism is there is a disconnect between the outer and the inner. Mm -hmm. And so you look for somebody with a vivid mental life okay. that you can that who is a who's a you know a, a quality nuanced performer who you can take the leap that they will understand the specifics of autism well enough to to live in their head while they're not able to live in the tactile world. So you go for this. Smart. Uh, that's it's it's fascinating just to see because where she, where you look at Claire Danes in Homeland. You look at her, and I mean Romeo and Juliet for me mm -hmm. when I was growing yeah, up. Like, totally. Oh my God. Yeah, David Kessen. And then in Temple Grandin, she she becomes Temple Grandin. The mm -hmm. voice she nails, the way uh -huh. she moves her body when she's yeah. writhing on the bed, she went there. How do you build a cast around something like that too? Because I mean you had. You had some wonderful people who supported her work, Catherine O'Hara. Yes, right. And and, and David Strathairn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're. Uh, let's see. Like with David Strathairn, his kind of innate um, goodness, I think, is a uh, is something that was uh, helpful because he was a doctor, I think, for mm -hmm. her. So like his his natural. Uh, empathy, I think, was is a, is a helpful color to add to, or that's that's the that's the role. In sure, a way. especially um, in conjunction to all the other doctors and teachers uh -huh. that he was around. And you know, Catherine O'Hara would be like a kind of like fun, charming, but with like um, a lot of heart in yes, this movie. Right, right, for sure. Like, and and sometimes you could liken it to casting a. Uh, a symphony, you know, like you look for the bassoon, uh, uh, flute. Mm -hmm. You know, like each person is a is a is a is a tune. You know what I mean? And so yeah. you look, and so you kind of try and feel if it's harmonious or not. Um, so this there's one... been times when I've made mistakes about that. Like I was like... casting a uh, a 
kind of light summer camp movie and I thought it was very cool to cast people who'd been in Fargo, so we cast Peter Stormare as the camp counselor, and he was very good, but like essentially miscast in the part because way off because of type, yeah? yeah, yeah, and not in a helpful way. Uh, like I, I used to, I used to think cool equaled good. No, right for the part equals good. Okay, you know what I mean. Yeah. So. Similarly, like uh, the way I like to work is 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 not kind of chase the tail of um, marketability and chasing the tail of uh, expectation. You try and you try and make it the very best thing it could be, because when it's awesome, that's when people will see it. Uh, one thing I tell actors is it looks like the power is in the edifice of Hollywood because there's they have expensive suits and they have nice theaters and they send memos and they do all these very important feeling things. Mm -hmm. But the only reason all of the edifice of Hollywood exists is because people around the world are willing to pay money to feel empathy with the actors as they sure. creatively uh, pretend. And so the actor essentially has the power. Mm -hmm. We don't have the power. You do. They do. And once and and so if you are able to find a way to kind of like own what you do and move through the vicissitudes of of a career in Hollywood owning what you do as an actor as an artist then you are ahead of the game because it's a different conversation sometimes when i do auditions i say that was very good that was good that was the audition version of it now let's do the documentary version of it the idea being that the actor's desire to get the part, the need, the want, the hope, it isn't the character's objective. It isn't, the character doesn't care if you get that job. Any energy spent that way is energy that isn't going this way. And so when I, we do it again, you know, you kind of let go of the ultimate objective of doing this so that I'll get a job. You do it just to really do it and the camera observes it, and the camera can feel that difference, uh, and yeah. and that reality is something that helps them get the job. That's a hard thing to. It's a hard it's thing a because really it feels it's do. counterintuitive because you it is. what what you're present to is your desire to get the job, but that's not what the character's present to. Sure, the character's just living their life. And when you hear stories about people booking stuff, but especially stories about people who are oh, I was just about to leave town and I booked this one role uh -huh. and it made me into. Mm -hmm. Whatever. That's at the point where they stopped caring about getting the job, where yeah. all of their energy is focused on being present, being right there in the moment, doing everything doing they can do. Or, yeah, and then letting it go. Yeah, and the letting it go is 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 a hard thing. It is. You have to you have to um, you have to do all the work. You have to want it. In, you have to want it badly enough to really find a way to care deeply about it. Mm -hmm. You have to do it perfect. You know, awesomely, and then. You have to let all of that go, and if you don't let it go, it kind of accrues like 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 plaque in your yeah. arteries. Uh, uh, and so that push and pull is very hard for an actor because you love it so much, and then you have no control over it. And you love it so much, you have no control. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it it makes it, actors find a way to deal with that vulnerability. They either become um, calloused. You know, like, no, I don't really want it. I'm not going to really try. Sure. Blah, 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 blah. Or they go nuts. Like, maybe if I, maybe if I, you know, did did this or did this, or maybe if I wore blue. If I can or, bury myself or did, into yeah, it. Yeah, maybe yeah. if I had my secret yeah. socks on or, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter either. Yeah. No, the only time it matters is when you're listening and responding and being the character in as awesome as you're going to be. And um, so if you can find a way to really go for it and then really let it go, you'll you're ahead of the game. That's what I'd like to say there. Great. Um, so I'm also I'm everybody's interested in firsts. What was it like the first time you were on screen with as Cart Pusherman uh, in 97's Bean, uh, which you were mm -hmm. a casting associate on? And uh, Christopher Guest, you were which number four in a mighty win? Yes, I was. With well, I w um, I actually stopped doing that about ten year, fifteen years ago. Okay. Because I said to myself, you know, it was fun to be asked, and I was a good reader at auditions, sure. and so it's kind of flattering to have them think I'm good enough to be in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I realized about 15 years ago, you know what? Let somebody who's willing to put up with the bullshit of being an actor mm -hmm. have that part because okay. I shouldn't be the one playing that part. You, you know, working with Christopher Guest, mostly it was just about being cool enough to be invited to the party. So to, we, I did two movies with him and uh, where, you know, he had his core group of people usually, so it was kind of casting around the edges. Just to be able to sit in the room and, and bullshit yeah, with Christopher Guest, or <laughs> uh, I have a story about Curb Your Enthusiasm where I was so, I felt so lucky to be in the room sometime. Um, we were casting for Larry's dad, mm -hmm. and um, and in comes Shelley Berman, you know, Shecky Green, mm -hmm. followed by Shelley Berman, and Shecky Green's like an old school uh, Borscht Belt comedian, yeah. yuck yuck, you know, and it's funny, he's very funny, yeah. and he does his thing, and it's funny, it's funny, and then, and then uh, Shelley Berman comes in, and Shelley Berman was one of the founders of Chicago Improv. Oh. And he is starting improving and Larry's starting improving and you know it's 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 happening in front of you because there was nothing there was no script. Uh -huh. So like it just happens and it becomes this tremendously funny thing and and you're in the room watching it. It it's like that line from Hamilton to be in the room where it happens. Uh -huh. That's one of the things that I love about casting. Because you're in that you're you're your witness to that moment of, of, of something catching fire, and then it's and then it's there. It's really cool. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah, it is cool. Um, so another one that I watched of yours uh, that I hadn't seen before. One of my favorite parts about doing this show is going through somebody's, especially uh -huh. with casting directors. You guys work on so many films. Like if it's if I was interviewing directors, it's a little bit easier because two There's, years uh -huh. in between each yeah, movie and it's yeah, a yeah, lot yeah, less. Yeah, yeah. But with you guys, you've you've cast so many things. I watched City of Ember. Oh yeah. That movie was fantastic. I know, it's under underappreciated. Extremely underappreciated. Yeah, I know. Um, which is which is and disappointing. It had Sir Sharon Ronan in basically her second that was, part. Yeah. That I was don't remember very her early in her yeah, career. She and she it, was phenomenal. She was phenomenal. She was so good. And I know. and I mean you've got her with Bill Murray. Yeah. Playing I know. a bad guy who he never we plays lucked bad out. guys. We looked out. Some, we just called his lawyer, I think. <laughs> and however you can get a hold of yeah, him. Yeah, I think it was his lawyer. And somebody left a message and he was like, mm, I don't know, do I get to go to Scotland? <laughs> I like I like golf. Okay, I'll do it. Sure, get a give him a big belly to wear the whole time. It was it, we we lucked out. That was a it was a really fun movie, yeah, and was, and I the thing that stood out to me about that one is it reminded me a lot of like Brazil or mm -hmm. those kind of absurdist yes, movies. That. The characters the, they were all very charactery. I yep. don't know how else to describe that. How is it that you go about casting something that's much more, let's say. Uh, sharply, big, uh -huh. sharply dressed yeah, yeah, yeah. and and over well, you the look, top. you look. Well, you look for actors who um, who can fill that in mm -hmm. a way. Um, I don't know that the process is different. Okay. With each with each job, one of the things I like about the job is each job has like a like a prism through which you need to view what you're seeing, okay. or like a filter, so that so that. You know, those people don't make it through the filter because they aren't what we need right here. Sure. But the ones who do kind of make it through okay. so that so that uh, so that uh, you end up with the right people. Mm -hmm. um, so for that, you'd want people who had probably a comic bent to them, uh, who can who can do two things at once, who can kind of be big and yet be real enough for you sure. to not just see them being fake. Absolutely. Uh, uh, who had a kind of brio about them mm -hmm. so that so that you're so that you enjoy what they're doing. Uh, that, I don't know. That movie was a lot of fun. Just like I wish there were more Terry Gilliams out there. Uh -huh. And this it, it seemed to be kind of in that vein of I wonder larger why than life. And I mean like maybe I would think there could be more now because yeah. because the 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 effects to create a whole different world are easier to do. Absolutely. I, I would like to see more of huh. that. Okay, well, I'll yeah. tell someone. Thank you. I appreciate welcome. that. And, and going off the back of that, because you talked about casting these different types of things, uh -huh. uh, I want to talk about something that was interesting in your career. If we start okay. in 2011, you started with the Smurfs, 
in 2011, mm -hmm. which is half live action, half animated, mm -hmm. followed by Real Steel, which right. is a movie that I love. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I rewatched it again. Uh, I had a buddy of mine who has seen that movie probably 40 times. <laughs> Great. He loved that movie. Great. Um, then, same year, you followed up with Citizen Gangster, a period piece. Yes. Uh -huh. um, then, starting off 2007, a short film called The Procession. Then, the On the Road adaptation. Uh, then, Zero Dark Thirty. And then, Gravity. So, <laughs> I guess my question here is... Is, are there are there certain genres that you prefer over one or another, or do you intentionally go after something that's different than the last, so as not you pigeonhole really, yourself or bore yourself? You know, you try and get the work, and you see what you get. Sure, you know what I mean. Um, uh, but I do. I, I when I can get the job, I uh, love working on different things, mm -hmm. um, so that you know, uh, uh, you know, a small little funny movie is as much pleasure as a big action-y thing. There's a minus to that in that you become, you're you not the go-to person for one thing. So I may not have as lucrative a career as other people because I'm, okay. I'm not the, for, you know, like they'll get the big version of the be of what that is. The big Hollywood comedies. That big tentpole. That's, that big yeah. tentpole comedy. They have, there's, there's people who do that more. But as I... I was, um, most of those movies you mentioned were with my part, uh, casting partner, David Rubin, mm -hmm. and we had a wonderful working relationship. And then when I went out on my own again, uh, I was like, hmm. And I loved working with him, uh, but when, I, when I, I had to say, what is the center of what I love? Because in this limited time we have, what am I going to do with this time? And the center of what I love are like small human scale dramas and comedies and things about people that are, they don't have to be smart. I mean, stupid funny is is great. Uh, sure. But like they're usually... I mean, yeah, dude, where's my car? Dude, where's like, my car? I mean, come on, like, bro. That's stupid funny, uh, but it yeah, hit yeah, me yeah. at a time you when know, I was I like, if I cast work, I would love to have cast workaholics and that sure. kind of thing. Sure, sure. Um, but like the small little... Uh, small little things are the things that I like the most. And when you uh, live, when you dedicate your time and energy to going for it, going for what you love pays dividends because you enjoy it so much. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you're not as annoyed. If you, if I can make a living, I'm fine. Sure. I don't need to make. It would be wonderful to make, be super rich and be super fancy, but I think essentially I'm not that person because I real because my because what I love the most is these small little awesome things. Sure. And you've done and kind of owning of up to that and not spending time pining for who you are not mm -hmm. uh, is, is something I think you learn as you grow older. So. When do you feel like you found that? Uh, I think with probably, I think about I think about that time. Okay. Like when I, because I stopped trying to be everything for everybody, and uh, and I think you kind of have an it, it gives you an integrity about who you are, and when you're doing your work in casting, you have an integrity about the conversation. Sure. I was doing a, a TV pilot where for the first time I didn't care if I was liked. I used to be, huh. I want you to love me. I want you to think I'm so fabulous. I want you to think I'm the best and the coolest and blah, 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 blah. That's not essentially the gig. Mm -hmm. Essentially the gig is to offer your energy and your creativity and your best vision of how you think it could go best. So the movie sure. or TV show will be awesome that everybody will want to pay to see it. Some And before then, I would not have hard, I would, not all the time, but like I would, uh, shy away from hard conversations because I wanted to be liked. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm too old for that. And because of that, it, there's an efficiency to the communication. Oh, you okay. know, you don't have to take what I'm saying, but here's my genuine opinion, and the authenticity of that registers. I think so that you uh, hopefully work with people who get what you're putting out and they can it's at the end of the day it's it's not my movie to make I describe mm -hmm. casting as um, you're kind of the you're kind of essentially the place where good things happen because you contribute everything you can 
you, you, you work your ass off and then they go off and they make the movie or they make the TV show or the play. Uh, so you're not in that, in, you, you, you're, you're, you're vital and then you're not. Essentially, it's their thing to create. So you were there to serve the director and producer uh, vision and to uh, uh, help the actor feel as expressed as they ever can feel so that they will hopefully get the job. So I'm kind of like the garden, the, the boxing ring, whatever metaphor you want to use. I'm the place, I'm the home where the work happens. It's trippy when you go to the uh, rap parties because like you're like the old girlfriend. Because they're like, oh yeah. That nobody's seen for ages. I used to have an intense relationship <laughs> with you. I'm having an intense relationship right now, but it's sure. so nice to see you. And for a while I was heartbroken. I was like, why, what? But like, sure. mm, that's what it is. That's what it is. How do you deal with those aspects of it? Is it was it just the it's time like, it's of... like It's like, it's like what I tell the actors. You have to really love it and then yeah. really let it go. Because it's not personal. It's not personal. It's just like people, I think, get myopic about what's in front of them and who's their best friend right now. It's real easy to do. And yeah. they had a best friend, but like now they have a new best friend. One of my favorite casting experiences in the last four years, three years? I forget when it just happened. It's a movie that I hope will be going to festivals soon. It's called OG. It's a movie with Jeffrey Wright in the lead, mm -hmm. set in a prison, and we used five or six professional actors, and then the rest were prisoners in the prison in Indiana. So about three years ago, I was having an open casting call in a maximum security prison. And I loved it because it, 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 uh, it made absolutely clear, like we, um, I learned a whole bunch of things from it. One thing is is like is is one thing I love about casting is you with each thing it has its own set of requirements and its own idiosyncrasies and sure. its own kind of world view and doing that project is not something that I would ever have experienced in my real life but I got to wa observe and watch and l and be present to what that is and it's such a mind-blowing combination of their fault, our fault, nobody's fault. Um, like uh, in the casting process, what I would do when I usually hold open calls is I bring in a group of people at a time and I ask them to talk about themselves just to kind of get a, get a vibe of them. Because sure. you can tell very quickly if somebody's l listening, if somebody's smart, if they're essentially funny or not, or, or uh, too shy to really work or do it, mm -hmm. um, uh, and get an essential sense of them. And then I ask those that seem to f be okay and who might fit the specs of the parts that we got, I need a 30-year-old uh, prisoner uh, to audition the next day. But I would have these interviews with these guys and I would say like, you know, so, so what do you do in the prison all day? And do people different, you have different jobs, but about half of, a fourth of them, I'm on, I forget the term they use, but I'm on suicide watch. When people are ready to kill themselves, it's my job to try and talk them down. And I look at Hollywood and I look at acting and I think, we think we have hard problems? Yeah. You know, try living your life, living your life in those circumstances. And one other thing I, I was reminded of, although I've seen it before, is, is there can be amazing acting everywhere. The second or third lead of the movie, second lead of the movie, is a guy who lives in the prison, who is a natural actor. Hmm. He, he listens, sure. he knows what he wants to do with the scene, he uh, found a way that it's important to him, um, he, you know, he like imagines it, and yet when he's doing it, it feels totally real, which is the trick of acting, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and it's like, you know, like all of us dumbos, you know, worrying it about it and needing to go to class, it happens if you, let it happen. Yeah. It can happen if you let it happen, but you have to let it. You have to you have to 
you have to let it happen. Sure. And uh, to see that, totally humbling. Totally Had humbling. Had he ever acted no. before? No. 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 He, he just loved. Just... It. He loved. It. He knew the world. He loved the script. He huh. read the script a hundred, you know, dozens and dozens of times. Sure. And he knew how to pretend. It's fascinating to me because yeah. when you, as a, as somebody from the outside of a prison, or just somebody in general, mm -hmm. thinking about a prisoner, you don't really think about the fact that they're also a human being and have likes and. It, it, because that whole system kind of depersonifies you. It That's takes right. that away. Yeah, yeah, it does. And uh -huh. every single person in there is a human being. They're going through things, even though they're locked up and they're in a cell and they're, yeah. their day-to-day -day is very meticulously laid out before mm -hmm. them for years and years. They have hopes and dreams. They have, a, 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 it, it sounds like yes, this guy had a very... And, and they have responsibilities for what they've yeah. done. And it's a, it's a and responsibilities a for each other, mix. and it's fascinating. But it's it's uh, uh, yeah, it is. It's fascinating. And it sounds kind of uh, not just enlightening, but also a little bit kind of heartbreaking to yeah to yeah to like, actually make uh, those realizations. It's not an like easy thing. Like there's guys in there. Like uh, it's Indiana, so they want to. So there's no government support. Mm -hmm. So uh, they took like they took away the college courses. They took away the college courses because they were too expensive. So there's no you can Come get on, your Indiana. GED, but that's it. That's it because the idea is to punish. And so how on earth anybody so is ever really going to get sense. better? So what do you do when you're looking at your whole life being this? Yeah. How does that? How does that? torque you into a, to a, to a fucked up shape. And what insight do these guys bring into a, this? Because you said you had four or five leads mm -hmm. that were actor-actors, and uh -huh. then the rest were, what sort of insights come from working with people who are there day in and day out, who have been prisoners for years, who have, do they bring uh, any of that into the audition, into oh, the room, yeah, into yeah, the yeah, conversations yeah, yeah. with like, you? Like the, like, the, like the handsome young guys are all, have a screw loose? Or they are uh, fully defended, cause hmm. they're gonna get hit up first. It's intensely fucked up, and it's intensely real. It's intensely real, sure. and it's like what we pretend to, what we play at often in other in in movies. When somebody's a gangster or a or a badass, the, you know the the guy who lives in three one zero pretends that in a way that's sure. acceptable to all of us watching it, but it's not, it's not the real of it. Mm -hmm. what, why, why was the decision made to do that rather than casting? She'd, um, she had, uh, she's a documentary filmmaker, and she'd mm. gotten, over the course of many years, uh, their trust, and she, she uh, uh, kind of won them over to signing off on doing the movie there. Um, they okay. had to build in things, like we didn't, we weren't able to audition 90% of the prison because they had to not be on um, probation or not be on any sure. uh, violent offenders list. Um, so we kind of saw the cream of what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they had to build in extra weeks of sh extra time for shooting because uh, when the prison would go on lockdown, everybody had to go and sit in their cell. Sure. Uh, and so which would interrupt filming for the day. Um, but they built all of that in and then made okay. a movie. And they had to donate most of their salaries, I think, to a uh, victim's defense fund, victim's fund, of sure. word. It's w one of my favorite experiences because, because it's not, uh, for, because it's not something I would ever, I hope I would never have to experience it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that makes my life an, a, a, a real adventure. I get to, Kind of honor that if I do right, I'm honoring them mm -hmm. by putting what they are in the movie. Sure, you know what I mean. Absolutely. Like I'm picking the act, picking the prisoner, picking the actor who will do the best job at at being themselves in a way mm -hmm. um, in that moment, so that the world can see what that is sure. or feel it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that yeah. sounds. It sounds like a really fascinating. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was experience. really fascinating. Um, so I, I do want to talk a little bit too about because you, you when we messaged you first about this you said 
you work in both Los Angeles and New York. You mm -hmm. live in New York, but you do a lot of work here. Yeah, I lived here for 20-something years, and then I moved there three years ago. And I do okay. what I'm happy to work wherever. Um, one thing I noticed about New York, like, um, because New York's an expensive city, because there's less jobs there, so the act. So when I have auditions there, it there's more good per capita. Okay. Because you got to be on point. Cause, sure. Because because there's not a lot of work, so you got to be ready. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing I would say to the actors watching is, be that person who's on point. Whether what city you what city you live in, because because if you're on point, you're ahead of. 60% of the people in LA and you're you're ahead of 25% of the people in New York but like being on point require you know that's those that th those are the people who get the jobs unless it's a luck of their beauty or their particular vibe sure. or their you know quality as a person so what is that what is on point to you what uh, being mean? totally prepared being being uh, understanding why it's important to them being able to uh, let it all go and really kind of uh, listen and respond and yet have all of that work having been part of what you're doing. Great advice for actors. Pay attention. Thank you so much for coming in today, Richard. Uh, you're very welcome. It's, it's been a blast talking to you and I hope everybody at home has learned as much as I have. All right. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Well, we hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Placing Faces. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, love, heart, thumbs up, and share so we can keep making the show. Tune in next week when we chat with Donna Morong, whose work you'll recognize from Gone Baby Gone, 10 Things I Hate About You, The Princess Diaries, and a whole lot more. One of the jobs I had when I was um, first starting out was I was an agent for a very short time for Ambrosia Mortimer, and they had a client named Sam Jackson. They didn't quite know what to do with this guy, Sam Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him in a play in New Jersey, and, and was yeah, it was like a snowy day, and a snowy night, and we nearly veered off the road and stuff. But um, I said, you, you shouldn't drop this guy. He's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and of course, you know, he hadn't had any big breaks, but I guess at some point, he must have had a relationship with Spike Lee. Spike Lee knew him and that sort of launched his career. Placing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale your production based on your needs. Video professionals find work and companies save money. We'd also like to thank our partners at the Casting Society of America for helping to introduce us to so many of our guests. They also serve as a hub of information about this branch of the film industry. To learn more about the Society and what it takes to get into casting, you can visit their site at castingsociety.com. If you're a casting director and want to be a part of this program, please email us at contact at placingfaces.com. Thank you so much for listening. It is our intention to keep sharing the stories of these casting directors every single week for the foreseeable future. So don't forget to tune in.